From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Laura Considine, Mr. Dollar. You don't know me, but... Oh, but I do, Mrs. Considine. You're the best friend a doctor ever had. Dr. Palmquist, that is. Mr. Dollar, He paid you a professional call the night his wife was murdered. That was lucky. Alibis don't grow on trees. Just a minute, Mr. Dollar. Look, lady, I've been slugged, shot at. Matter of fact, someone tried to pick me off with a rifle a couple of hours ago, right near your house. Maybe Dr. Palmquist will alibi you this time. Return the courtesy. Will you please listen? I've got to see you. I've got to talk to you. All right, when? An hour. The bar at your hotel. The martinis will be waiting. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account concluded. There were still a lot of questions, like where I was getting, trying to find out who really had killed Mrs. Palmquist. Like, was it all a smoothly planned frame on the part of her doctor husband? Or had it been a prowler killing by another man now in jail? Or had the dead woman's son, Eric, a complex we didn't know about? Mrs. Considine was five minutes late, but I hoped she could answer some of them. Mr. Dollar? Oh, come now, Mrs. Considine, that reading. It implied we haven't met before, and you know that we have. Well, I don't remember. The day you visited Dr. Palmquist in the hospital and pretended you had the wrong room. Sit down. There was a reason for that. Sure, there's one for everything. Is there? You think Victor Palmquist had something to do with his wife's death. Well, you're wrong. Completely wrong. Correction. You don't know what I'm thinking, and being wrong is anybody's privilege. You don't know about Victor, Mr. Dollar. What his life's been like, what he had to put up with. Why don't you tell me, Mrs. Considine? That wife of his. A millstone around his neck. A woman in love with a bottle. Go on. And that son of his, that Eric. Insane. Completely insane. He hates his father. He always has. He gains a fortune by that woman's death. But do you suspect him? No, of course not. You badger a man like Victor Palmquist. Now, does that make sense? You're building a big thing on the fact that a lot of people hate Victor Palmquist, but you're overlooking something. Mr. Dollar. Where there's that much hate, there's always a good reason. I went to the hotel garage, rented a car, and pointed it toward Burbank. There was a man in a pawn shop there I wanted to see. The man who had identified Lonnie Miller as the buyer of the gun that had killed Mrs. Victor Palmquist. He turned out to be a mild, friendly little guy with thick glasses and a desire to please. He barely glanced at my identification, pushed it back over the counter to me, and smiled. What do you want to know? Everything you can remember about the man who bought the gun, Mr. Lerner. What's to remember? A kind of skinny, gray-haired fella come in, said he wanted to buy a gun. I showed him one. He bought it. He showed you a driver's license for identification, didn't he? I copied the information right here in the book. Uh, right here. Lonnie Miller, 173, Fuller, San Diego, height 6 feet, weight 152, color white. Here, here, look yourself. Yeah. Look at this paper, Mr. Lerner. One of these, the fella? Hmm, uh, let me see. Lerner adjusted his glasses and leaned forward to peer at the newspaper I'd put on the counter. It was the way I was leaning on the paper that really started the whole thing. The two pictures were side by side, Dr. Palmquist in a business suit and Lonnie Miller in a cap, leather jacket, and work pants. My arm was covering everything but the faces. Lerner moved my arm before pointing out Miller as the buyer of the gun. Then he nodded emphatically. Sure, that's the fellow who bought the gun, that Miller. You had to move my arm before you'd say so, Mr. Lerner. You were covering up half the picture. What am I, a mind reader? No, but I think you might have made the most normal mistake in the world. Wait, wait. You were trying to tell me this Miller didn't come in here and buy a gun from me? That's about it. So how come a fellow who wasn't here gave me a driver's license and said he was? That's a good question, Mr. Lerner. There were two people I wanted to see now real bad. Lieutenant Barry at Homicide and Lonnie Miller, cell 8A City Jail. I streaked down to headquarters and guess what? The lieutenant was out on police business. Should be back in a while. 
I knew Lonnie Miller wasn't out, so I settled for him. There were only two or three questions I wanted to ask him, but they were important. I spent about 15 minutes in the cell with Miller, got my answers, and they made sense now. Then I spent an hour waiting for the lieutenant. He finally showed. This time, he was the hard sale, even after I discussed what I'd figured out at the pawn shop. Johnny, Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, sure, me too. Now, look, Lieutenant, you know what I'm pushing is possible. Dr. Palmquist and Lonnie Miller are approximately the same size, age, coloring. Even the bone structure is fairly similar. But they don't look alike. They don't have to, because it's the impression that counted here. Johnny! That's exactly what Palmquist was counting on. Now, look, Lieutenant, you've been around. You know what people go by when they're asked to identify someone. And all over impression. So? And you know a big factor is clothes. Particularly the type of clothes. All right, all right. What are you going for? This. If Dr. Palmquist walked into that pawn shop wearing a cap, leather jacket, and work pants, and then, six days later, you show the pawnbroker a picture of Lonnie Miller, dressed in the same kind of clothes, you know whom he'll identify every time especially when he'd already seen a driver's license made out to Lonnie Miller. A thousand ways to make a living. What did I pick Lieutenant. Look, suppose I buy that. Where are you? Dr. Palmquist, for some reason or other, wants his wife dead. He needs a patsy. So he picks up Lonnie Miller, a hitchhiker on the Pacific Coast Highway. If you say so. At a coffee stop, the doctor remembers something he left in the car. He goes out for a minute, sticks a match or a toothpick in a tire valve, guaranteeing a flat a few miles further on... So when they stop, it's the doctor who looks at the flat, gets rid of the toothpick. Grateful for the lift, Miller changes the tire. You ever change a tire on a hot summer night? Well, sure. You took off your jacket, didn't you? How else? That's what Doc was counting on. He had a couple of minutes alone with Miller's jacket and lifted his driver's license. Then he keeps Miller in town on the promise of a job. He buys the gun at the Burbank pawn shop wearing work clothes and giving Miller's license as identification. Monday night, he killed his wife, called Miller to the house with a phony story about a job, struck him from behind, and staged the scene the police found. Smooth, huh? Johnny, can you see me going to the D.A. with all that theory and no proof? Palmquist had laughed me out of town. Barry, look. Knock it off. You're no kid. You know I'm right. Ah. Well, don't go away, Matt. Sure, I know he was right. That's what was driving me crazy. Proof. One little piece of it, but where? Old Palmquist had used his head all right. But the smartest ones alive always leave one little hole somewhere along the line. But three hours later in my hotel room, I hadn't found it. Steffi, what are you doing here? Johnny. Eric's been drinking all day, brooding, working himself into a rage, saying terrible things about Mrs. Considine and his father, and about his father being a murderer. I don't know what he'll do. Help me, Johnny, please. Did he give you any idea of where he was headed? He, he mentioned going home to get a gun and then going to Mrs. Considine's house. Johnny, I'm afraid. All right, come on. The drive to the Palmquist house on the Palisades was a long one, but educational. Because Steffi had nothing to hide now. She was just a kid worried to death about her husband. And her bitterness toward Dr. Palmquist came rolling out. He's an easy man to hate, my father-in-law. All charm on the outside. A petty little dictator inside. A man who's trying to prove something, who can't abide weakness. Who tries to make everyone over into his own image. A horrible man. Tell me about Eric's brother. Paul? He was the favorite. The doctor's pride and joy. They hunted together all the time. Only one day, Paul had a cold. Tried to get out of a hunting trip. This offended the doctor's weakness fetish made the boy feel like a coward, so Paul went hunting and died of pneumonia. Mrs. Palmquist never got over it, as you saw before she was killed. Nice, Johnny. You like the family I married into? The house was dark when we got there. We hurried to Eric's bedroom, and Steffi leaned against the door, weak with relief. Eric lay sprawled on the bed, snoring fine alcoholic noises. The rifle he still clutched made very clear what he'd been thinking about before the liquor had taken over. We were just getting him comfortable when we heard it. A car pulling into the garage. Palmquist. I got Steffi down the back stairs and out of the house as soon as I was sure he was inside. And then I turned back. Because suddenly I was tired of a killer walking around free while everyone else stepped softly. And the anger was good. Because it suddenly drove into my mind the one thing Palmquist might have overlooked. 
I let myself into the garage for the small window, moved to the doctor's big car. You ever try to force open a car trunk with a claw hammer? Don't. A, it's rough, and B, it takes your eyes off the door leading to the kitchen. Why don't you ask me for the key, Dollar? A gun, doctor? No instrument of healing? Oh, that's nice. And it tells me something about the trunk. That there's a spare tire in there that's flat, but doesn't have a puncture. A service station might remember a thing like that, huh, doctor? Quite right, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. He couldn't pick me off because of the car, but the car was working against me, too. You did better with a rifle yesterday, doctor. I'll manage, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Man my age, through windows, no less. He had it? Nah. Nah, he'll look good in court. Small question, Lieutenant. Not that I'm ungrateful. Ask. Aren't you a long way from home? I didn't like the look in your eye when you stomped out. You know something, Johnny? You're easier to tail than a trolley car. Expense account, item 12, $71. L.A. hotel bill. Item 13, $174.90. Return airfare to Hartford. Expense account total, $490.80. Details? Eric Palmquist admitted sending us the original warning note out of fear of his father. He never knew till the death of his mother that he himself was the beneficiary. Remarks about Hollywood. Let's call it the Easterner's Revenge. Quote, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Unquote. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, $3 million worth of a worthless gold mine. And there's blood on the desert sand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Lillian Bayef, Russell Thorson, James McCallion, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, and Herb Butterfield. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Thank you.